Good morning, John. Thank you very much for allowing us to, to come to see you. Um, so John Elliott has ended uh, his latest book, History in the Making, with a truly splendid sentence, which I would like to quote. This book will have served its purpose if it is read as the testimony of a historian who has tried to understand. Just before that, you say, there's still a great deal to be learned about some of the themes touched upon in the pages of this book, like the capacity for survival of Spain's global empire and the particular ways in which politics, culture and society interacted in the Hispanic and early modern European worlds. Now, why do you think that the Spanish empire lasted for so long? Well, there are a number of possible explanations. Uh, I think one has to remember that uh, for the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, it was not known so much as the Spanish Empire as the Spanish monarchy, uh, the Monarquía Española. And this Spanish monarchy uh, consisted of Spain itself, which itself was made up of a number of kingdoms, uh, Spain's possessions in Northern Europe, in the Netherlands, and over a large part of Italy, and also uh, Spain's empire of the Indies, of America. So that you've got these three parts, uh, European, Spanish, and uh, American. And uh, they were acquired in different ways at different times. Uh, many of them were acquired by uh, hereditary succession of the crown, and were joined uh, together under the King of Spain, uh, retaining their old uh, system of government, their own laws, liberties and so on. So that uh, somebody in the Netherlands or in uh, Naples would think of the King of Spain as their king. And there is an intense and intrinsic loyalty uh, which uh, makes them uh, have a sense of obedience uh, to the monarch of the moment. Uh, Spanish America was a conquered territory, conquered by Castile, and obviously is, is ruled in another way. Uh, but there again, uh, that too is divided into kingdoms and traditional kingdoms like uh, Mexico and Peru, uh, which began to develop their own sense of identity and which had a new class of settlers who um, again felt a sense of loyalty to their monarch. So I think we must begin in the sense, uh, there is this sense of loyalty, of all belonging, uh, being subjects of a king who happened to live in Madrid, but was also uh, the sovereign ruler of Mexico or of Naples or of Sicily. Um, so that's one possible explanation. Uh, but beyond that, obviously, uh, the king of Spain in the 16th and early 17th centuries was the most powerful monarch in the Western world. He had enormous resources at his disposal uh, because of the American silver, which was coming annually, uh, arriving in Seville from the mines of Mexico and Peru. And this made him immensely wealthy, in spite of all the financial difficulties uh, that uh, overcame him because of the degree of commitment in so many parts of the world. Uh, but uh, th there was this enormous power, so that behind uh, the capacity to draw on uh, the loyalty of, of subjects, there was also the threat in the background of coercion, of the exercise of power. So those are two possible explanations. Along with that, I think that uh, Spain is extraordinarily successful in establishing from very early on uh, a bureaucratic system of government, uh, a relatively efficient bureaucracy by the standards of the 16th and 17th centuries, um, uh, bureaucrats who've been trained in the law and were sent right across the Spanish monarchy uh, to impose uh, the royal order, royal decrees, and so on. And there was a whole system of tribunals and so on. Uh, it was a marvellous system uh, by which subjects who felt aggrieved uh, could uh, lobby and negotiate all the way up until finally appealing to the king himself uh, in Madrid. So there were escape mechanisms, as it were, when the pressures got too great. 
So there are all these things uh, helped to hold the monarchy together and at the same time one has to think that all of these territories uh, developed a kind of uh, natural ruling class, a, an elite, uh, and the elites uh, looked to the crown for rewards for the, its service, their services, and there was a constant process of negotiation between the government in Madrid and the elites in Italy, uh, Flanders, uh, Mexico, Peru, wherever it may be. And so one has to think of this as an empire which is partly based on pressure and power and partly on negotiation uh, between the monarch and the ruling classes in each of these territories. Yeah, that's very interesting. There was a, another element which you, you mention in, in one of the essays in, in Spain and its world, uh, in the mental world of Hernán Cortés, uh, where you, you, you talk about the roles played by culture and religion uh, in, the, in the, at least the beginning of the Spanish uh, undertaking in the, in the Indies. Um, you, you talk about the beginning when Castile itself was a, a medieval uh, society, but with a uh, the beginning of a, of, a, of a Renaissance influence, and then later on, um, the Erasmian uh, influence, and then the Counter Reformation. Um, how important do you think that the cultural and and uh, religion, religious uh, elements were also the the Franciscan uh, and Jesuit? Uh, um, activities in, in, in South America or in, in Central and North America. Do you think that they were also instrumental in the, in the undertaking? Yes, I mean, I think they were absolutely fundamental. Um, first of all, one has to think of the mentality of the conquistadores. Uh, they came from a peninsula which had spent centuries fighting against uh, Islam and against Moorish domination. They were imbued with a sense of crusading zeal mm. and it seemed natural in a way uh, to carry that uh, crusading zeal with them uh, across the Atlantic uh, to the New World. Uh, at the same time uh, there was this, uh, so there was a, an agenda of evangelization from the beginning and also a sense uh, the culture of the conquistadores insofar as they they had any learning. It was based on books of chivalry, particularly, which were extremely mm. popular in late mm. 15th, early 16th century Spain and indeed uh, across Europe. So uh, they saw themselves in terms of the, uh, the, the knights uh, of these tales of chivalry, uh, the world of Amadis of Gaul, and uh, indeed when uh, the conquistadores arrive and look down on the city of Mexico, uh, the immediate reaction is to think of those books of chivalry and of the tales of Amadis of Gaul and others. Uh, so that uh, there is that mentality from the beginning, which I think is perfectly, very clear in uh, Hernán Cortés, for example, mm -hmm. as the conqueror of Mexico. He thinks in those terms. But he's also um, very much imbued with this sense of religion. And... Uh, the New World uh, is granted to Spain and to Portugal by the Pope in a papal donation with the commitment to evangelize and convert the indigenous peoples who were, were discovered there. So that from the beginning this is a church-state enterprise and uh, the first missionaries are sent out very early uh, and Hernán Cortés asks for Franciscans to come and help in this tremendous process of uh, sa saving the souls of the Indians effectively, uh, baptizing, instructing them in the faith, in, Christ in Christian faith and so on. So that early on there, there is this commitment that famous 12 apostles of Franciscans uh, at the request of Cortes turn up in Mexico in the 1520s and after that, uh, they begin on this enormous task of evangelization right across the conquered territories uh, of America. Uh, the missionaries, the Franciscans, Dominicans, and later the Jesuits, 
are accompanied and succeeded and uh, preceded and uh, accompanied and sometimes su supplanted by the established church, uh, which again uh, imposes itself on the new world. There's an enormous process of church building from the beginning, building of convents and so on. I mean, if you go to Mexico today, you'll see convents all around central Mexico, many of them constructed in the 16th century, uh, with uh, some of the humanist images uh, of that period. And uh, you mentioned uh, the Erasmians. Uh, Erasmus' influence in the 1520s and 30s in Spain was still very strong. And indeed, uh, the first bishop, uh, a bishop of Mexico, Vasco de Quiroga, uh, who'd read uh, Thomas More's Utopia, mm. uh, set up uh, Indian villages based on Thomas More's Utopia uh, on the shores of Lake Pátzcuaro. Mm. Mm. Uh, as ideal communities. So you can see the influence of this humanist world in that first generation. Then I think the situation begins to change. The climate, intellectual, mental, cultural climate, begins to change. You get the coming of the Protestant Reformation in Europe, the hardening of religious lines between uh, Protestant churches and Protestant Europe and Roman Catholic Europe. You get the coming of the Counter-Reformation and at the same time, with um, greater experience and knowledge of the Indians, the friars who'd set up with such enormous hopes uh, about the possibility of converting these Indians, who seemed to them to be uh, innocent beings, uh, who could be used to recreate the church uh, uh, of the Gospels, of primitive Christianity, on the other side of the Atlantic, they began to become disillusioned. And there was a growing sense uh, of the sinfulness of these people that they were basically uh, like poor children who needed to be led, conducted, uh, disciplined uh, in order to be instructed in the true faith. Otherwise, they would be backsliding to idolatry and so on. And indeed, um, even uh, in fairly recent years uh, in a cathedral in Mexico, uh, when they were doing some excavations under the high altar, uh, they found uh, a, a, a pagan image put there by the first Indian workman, so that one can see the problems of trying to extirpate heresy uh, among these uh, uh, among this uh, semi-converted uh, population. But the church is everywhere, and of course uh, the church also imposes uh, its own discipline. It has its own ceremonies, uh, many of which seem to have been attractive to the Indians, but it. The result is the creation of a society in which the Indians, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this, have a particular place and are accepted as possessing a place and who are, are in a sense disciplined, at once disciplined and almost seduced into the church by liturgy, ceremonial and so on. And you'll find the Mexico, Indians in Mexico or Peru uh, still today uh, dancing the dances, the famous battle of uh, Christians against Moors, uh, which the Spaniards had brought ac across the Atlantic with them in the 16th century. And this has persisted in Indian villages uh, up to this day. Mm. That is a, a very curious uh, image uh, of our own um, images uh, surviving at, on the other side of the Atlantic, whereas, mm -hmm. in fact, nowadays on our side of the Atlantic, maybe they are less uh, welcome. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, mm, you are actually one of the first historians who have uh, uh, done transna transnational history, perhaps like Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme spoke prose without realizing it. You, you, that's what you say in, in, your, uh, in your memoirs, that you, you suddenly realized that the so-called transnational history was what you had been doing um, uh, since the beginning of, of your work as a historian. Do you think that there is, talking of transnational history and uh, thinking actually of one school of historians in, um, in the United States which believes that the frontier theory is not all that right to explain 
the birth of the United States, but there is a certain degree of uh, communication. Uh, Bolton was, uh, I think, the chief exponent of that theory. Do you think that there is, one can identify some sort of substratum uh, in parts of the United States, um, political or historical, not just language and not because of uh, immigration nowadays, but from the old um, Spanish presence in what is now the South Western uh, States, United States. Uh, can you imagine some sort of uh, influence that remains there? It's quite difficult um, to answer that. Of course, one has to also think of Texas and California yes. uh, as other parts of uh, Hispanic expansion in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, but I, I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, only three months ago, and there you've got the Central Plaza, uh, just like all the Spanish cities uh, uh, of America, and the same with uh, Santa Fe. And even if you look at those names of towns, Los Angeles, Santa Fe, uh, the name of Texas, Texas, uh, these Spanish names survive, uh, Spanish families to some extent survive, uh, and also, there are influences, as I understand, in the law of certain states, in family law, uh, in the question of water rights, for, in for instance. Uh, these, there are Spanish survivals, similarly in New Orleans, which is as much a Spanish in some ways city as, as a French as city. French. Hmm. Um, one often wonders um, what proportion had the rational and planning uh, attitudes of the beginning of the Spanish uh, presence in the Indies, um, what is the proportion between that and other uh, elements which obviously were present, such as um, uh, power? Yeah. Uh, I know that the there aren't any pure elements in, 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 in any uh, historical phenomenon or indeed in any, even less perhaps, in any imperial phenomenon. But um, one often wonders why is it thought that the uh, expansion of uh, Spanish power uh, should have been any less uh, planned or rational than any other expansion of power. Mm -hmm. Have you come across that doubt that is present in, 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 in anyone who, who, who studies the matter? Uh, yes, I mean, I think it's true to say that, um, I mean, the conquistadores were plunderers. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, if you look at the, the English who went to Virginia in the early 17th century and founded Jamestown in 1607, they were after exactly the same things uh, as the Spaniards. Uh, they wanted to dominate the Indians, uh, make them a labor force, and they wanted to find gold and silver mines. And uh, they had the same plundering mentality at the, mo at the beginning, but it didn't work out there because there were, the Indians weren't prepared to be domesticated and the, there weren't any gold or silver mines. Yes. Uh, so they had to develop uh, other forms of, of culture. Um, but that, that plundering, uh, which began in the Caribbean islands, was rapidly destroying the indigenous population of those islands. And Hernán Cortés, who had been uh, in uh, the Caribbean, spent some years there, uh, and indeed uh, sailed from there on conquest of Mexico, realized that if the same thing happened in Mexico, uh, very soon everything would be destroyed, the population would be wiped out and so on. So he already was thinking in terms of anchoring these conquistadores to the soil instead of letting them range right over the continent, which he did by trying, which had already been tried in, in uh, the island of uh, uh, Santo Domingo, uh, which, and uh, Española as it was called, um, which he'd already done there, which had already been tried there, the system of handing out, allocating Indians in encomienda uh, to a group of the conquistadores. And that, to some extent, helped to stabilize what otherwise would have been a movement of enormous dispersion right through the Americas in search of gold and silver. 
at the same time, uh, I think the natural, men, natural aptitude of the, of the Spaniards was to live in cities. And so uh, Cortes, from the beginning, was founding cities, and cities spread right across the Spanish New World. Uh, everywhere the Spaniards went, they founded cities and congregated in cities. And that also uh, was a form of rational planning, which was taken up particularly by Philip II, who was very anxious to get firm control over his empire of the Indies, and made a lot of ordinances in 1573 uh, saying exactly how cities should be laid out with the central plaza, uh, the governor's palace, the, the cathedral or church, and, and so on, and um, absolutely rational system, a sort of checkerboard or gridiron system of, mm -hmm. uh, of urban planning. So, uh, so there's planning really from very early years, including among, as I said, some conquistadores like, like Hernán Cortés. And as in the footsteps of the conquistadores, almost immediately, the bureaucrats come over. Uh, people who are concerned to preserve the king's uh, financial rights and his, uh, and his rights uh, over, the, over the New World and over their populations. So that there's uh, a, an intrinsic desire, obviously, to exploit the wonderful new resource of this world and its uh, ma massive populations in Mexico and Peru. But at the same time, uh, the government is determined uh, to keep a control over what's happening, uh, to prevent what might be called unilateral declarations of independence uh, by the first settlers and their families. And the crown succeeds. I mean, for three centuries, as we've said, uh, you know, the Spanish Empire of the Indies survives. And this is a, a remarkable feat in itself, without, on the whole, major upheaval, upheavals and rebellions until the later 18th century. That's very interesting, that seems to point out to a fact which is uh, that I can't remember who said that Britain acquired its empire in a fit of absent-mindedness, uh, but probably it didn't, neither did the Spain. Uh, th there wasn't so much absent-mindedness, there was rational uh, plans, and uh, which you have Absolutely. very yes. interestingly pointed out to. Um, you Mention in your in in your history in the making, it I may be allowed to quote you again from the book, which is so enjoyable. Uh, apart from illuminating, uh, you say in it uh, engagement with the other. By the other, you mean foreign cultures and nations may have served as the means to help them, historians, discover themselves. You add, and this is, I'm sorry, a personal question, but we are all interested to know your opinion. You say, whether my own was one of these cases, I am still half a century later unable to say. But I know that the attempt to understand a society or societies remote in space and time was and has continued to be a source of intense personal enjoyment. It is refreshing and exceedingly pleasant to hear someone who has obviously enjoyed his, his work uh, as a historian, since nobody will do any job well unless uh, uh, one enjoys it. Um, you, when, when you write, um, you, you mention, you quote the uh, the, the, the Encyclopédie, where uh, the infamous Frenchman, whose name I keep forgetting uh, because it irritates us Spaniards so much, what has Spain done for Europe? I think uh, it adds uh, during the last century or two or ten centuries, <laughs> you, uh, you, you, you discuss that uh, and obviously you don't agree with the Frenchman. But what has Spain done for America? Because this man was referring, unfairly I think, uh, to what Spain had done for, in, in fact one doesn't do anything for, but uh, <laughs> with or at or in, but what do you think uh, that in the end uh, Spain did to America? Probably a, a 
a mixture of things as, yeah. as, as in every nation. Well, it destroyed civilizations, yes. but it created a it civilization. Created. Uh, I mean, the, the destruction was terrible, uh, and what, 80 to 90 percent of the indigenous population of all the Americas were wiped out in the course of a century, by your, mostly by European diseases uh, from which they'd been immune. And so that, in a sense, the Spaniards were constructing something relatively new, uh, assimilating and incorporating uh, some of the old, particularly in the most densely settled regions of, of, of Mexico and the, okay. the Andes. And um, out of that, they created, over the course of two to three centuries, uh, a new form of society, a new form of civilization, uh, heavily religious, as we've said, uh, in which the indigenous population uh, assimilated at least certain aspects of Christianity and created uh, a, a, a dynamic Christianity of their own, which you can still see if you go into Mexico or Peruvian churches, uh, which in some ways may be not identical with the Christianity as practiced in, in, in old counter-reformation Europe, but has an obvious creativity of its own. Uh, at the same time, one of the things that the Spaniards did, and the British, I think, signally failed to do in North America, was to uh, attempt to incorporate the indigenous peoples they'd conquered uh, into an organic society. Uh, a society uh, based on hierarchy, like society in Europe of the 16th and 17th centuries, but in which uh, every section of society had an acknowledged place. And the Spanish crown in particular uh, had this obligation both to evangelize and protect the Indians. And there's a constant commitment by the crown over these three centuries to protect the Indians from exploitation by the settlers and so on, and to assimilate and incorporate them uh, into the societies that were being created. And although the protection didn't by any means always succeed, it did allow those Indians uh, to, in many ways, continue their own forms of life. They were known as the Republic of the Indians. They had their own uh, ability. They, they were very quick to learn how to work the Spanish system. They picked up the la Spanish language, the Spanish legal uh, structures and so on. They learned how to lobby all the way up to Madrid in order to protect their rights. Mm. So in that sense, they were being incorporated and assimilated uh, into, uh, into these new societies, uh, which in many respects was a great achievement. And some, one of the real disasters came with the coming of independence in uh, Iberian America in the 1820s and 30s, when the crown was suddenly removed and there was no one to protect the Indians from the sort of exploitation from which they had been protected by the Spanish crown uh, over three centuries. Thank you very much, John. What you've just said brings me back to, the, to your other uh, book, which I've been reading recently. In Spanish, I think Imperios del Mundo Atlantico is called uh, Empires of the Atlantic World. So, but the, the cover uh, um, is a very good uh, reflection on what you've been saying, the, the splendid picture in Peru of the uh, Inca uh, the family and the Spanish nobility, uh, and they, it's true that they mixed uh, in, a, in an interesting way. Anyhow, thank you so much Good, for pleasure. giving such a lot of knowledge and pleasure to your readers. That's very kind of you. I greatly enjoyed it. <laughs> thank you.